All right, Byron is going to go find out if we're speaking to another room. <laughs> <laughs> they're speaking to us. But I'll, but I'll go, go ahead and get started over here. So first of all, thank you all for coming. My name is Jessica Monaco. Um, <clears throat> I work here at Princeton as part of Web Development Services. That's going to be a little tricky. <laughs> Give them one second. <clears throat> Georgette, this is very similar to what Georgette. Georgette. <laughs> okay, I think we're rolling. All right, so today we're going to be talking about conferences. And um, here at Princeton, the majority of our customers, uh, we're not allowed to call them customers, we're going to call them campus partners. Really hard to break that habit. Um, we service departments, offices, centers, anyone on campus who needs a website. So we've had a core foundational platform um, that we are in the process of upgrading everyone, all of our 300 plus sites over to Drupal 9 right now. Um, we're almost done, we're in the final stretches of our upgrade. But we're always looking for ways to improve our platform and most recently we discovered and realized that we weren't servicing our campus partners who host really big events um, frequently. So as we kind of move into this in-person situation again and we're still trying to host hybrid events at the same time, um, we realized we needed to, to update and add features to our platform. So that's where all of the discussion and, and topics will, will come from today. So planning a conference is a really hard thing to do, lots of things and moving pieces, um, but we wanted to make building your website a really easy process. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? First, we'll define kind of what event characteristics we were looking at, all the research that we did of peer sites and things out there in the environment, um, what we came up with our, for our solutions uh, to our site builder platform. Uh, we'll take a look at our first site who is using all of, all of these features for a, a symposium that happened a couple weeks ago, and then we'll talk about registration. Um, and then, of course, throughout, throughout the session, we can always an, uh, have sure. questions. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we broke, we broke our sites, our campus partner sites, down into two different groups. Um, you might have a dedicated event website. So um, it might be a one-time event that happens once and never happens again, or it might be a reoccurring annual event. Uh, often these are co-sponsored by several groups, um, and they may have some relationship back to a parent site. Whoever is the primary sponsor might want to link back and promote it on their, on their existing site for their, for their group. Um, I have a bunch of examples here and we'll share these decks after, um, after camp is over and everything with, as the recording so you can take a look at these sites. But this is one example to the left of one that my group helped build. Um, this is a, a one-time conference and I think they're, gonna, they're planning to have it reoccur going into the future. So we kind of did a revamp. Um, this site was built before we added all of our new features, so this kind of spurred the conversation about what, what are we missing and how do we move forward. Um, another common type of site is a, nest, is a nested conference, so it's going to exist within a larger parent site. Um, events are not the main purpose of that site. Uh, the group probably hosts small events and large events throughout the year, and it requires heavy promotion of this conference prior to it, and then after that, kind of the site switches back to its primary focus of um, recruiting or informational for that department or group. Um, Grad Futures is one of our primary examples in the, as part of the graduate school. They host many large events throughout the year, um, but really the primary purpose of their site is, is kind of uh, professional development for students. So what are the components that we identified when we were looking at these types of sites, whether they're nested or part of a um, or a freestanding. So obviously you need to have clear and engaging landing page or home page. Um, that might include visual branding, graphics, logos. Um, often there's a defining color of a particular conference that might be separate from the parent site. Um, and they might even have custom fonts that change from year to year. Uh, there's always a clear audience needs to be defined right on the home page or landing page. Uh, the date the location, and then a theme or a mission. So often there's a, a theme each year of reoccurring conferences. You want to make sure that's really upfront so that people you're speaking to know, that, know what they're going to sign up for and what they're participating in. A couple examples out there in the ecosystem that I pulled out recently are Figma has a config conference. You'll see they have unique branding. 
prior to the conference, it's only been a hybrid conference. So they, you know, only have really nice Zoom screenshots of people looking at a screen. So they do a lot of, obviously it's design software, but they do a lot of custom um, animation and type, and that's kind of how they define their homepage, because they don't have a lot of in-person pictures that you might get at a, a physical event. Um, obviously Drupal, which we're all very familiar with, has really solid branding on their DrupalCon and Drupal Camps. You'll see those, um, those triangles, rainbow colors. You know that you're on a Drupal site for DrupalCon um, when you see those characteristic elements. And then another one we have here on campus is uh, that they hosted last year was Empower. They came up with a unique logo for it. They're still using Princeton colors, um, but they kind of created some graphic elements that they carry throughout the site. But you'll see on all of these, there's a date really uh, very clearly broadcast right at the top so that everyone knows that this is the one that's coming. You're not on a site that's passed. It's still relevant. And this is the topic that we're talking about. What are some other features that we identified? First of all, we need to look at the sessions. How do we know what the agenda is? Um, we saw this kind of done in two different ways. So first of all, you wanna group your sessions by day. Um, in terms of a conference that only has one day, it's pretty straightforward. You can just scan down the page. But when you have multiple days of sessions happening, we often, the most common pattern we found was that they're grouped across the top in tabs, and then you can scan down the page and see the whole schedule grouped by time. Um, a lot of times you can, the, either an accordion was a pretty common way to expose those details or they were just right up front depending on how complex those details might be. Um, again, I have examples of sites where we identified and found um, these samples that we then applied to our platform. And then the Drupal Camp site here for today is actually a really good example of concurrent events. So when there's more than one session happening, um, at any given time, and your participants have a choice of what they're going to attend. So that needs to be really clear what's happening in that time window. Um, you want to label them maybe by tracks or topics so that people understand if it's a design session, they know that those are the ones that are, inter that are interesting to them. Um, or you might have a taxonomy such as workshops or um, panels, uh, sessions, different types of the actual uh, event that they might be attending. So here's one <clears throat> where the speakers are a really important part of the conference. Here at Princeton, we get really prestigious people come um, from other universities, uh, institutions, for example. So promoting and, and including those speakers visually as well as their bio details is a really important part of the promotion of your event. Um, You'll see in this, in this circumstance, this is a, a tool um, called Visibo. We took a look at those tools to see if integrating them into our system might be the easiest way to go forward since they already had a pretty robust system. Um, but accessibility was kind of where we drew the line there. There's a lot of things that they still need to improve with that tool. Um, here's a good example of one where the tracks, as I mentioned, the, the topics of each session are really broadly called out. They used color coding to do that. Um, and you can see the different types of sessions so you know what you're, what you're getting into, what you might be interested in. Dedicated speaker pages. Obviously, as I mentioned, sometimes we have a people content type in our platform, um, but that's really reserved often for faculty, staff. It's the people who are putting together a conference or the people who are part of a department. Um, we didn't want to get that mixed up with guest speakers. Uh, so you'll see, uh, a, a dedicated place for these speaker pages that then links back to the event pages. And then finally, we took a, lot, a look at dedicated event tools and what they, what they do versus what we could offer. Um, these are super robust tools and it's obviously their job and it's a paid service that you're signing up for. So we kind of cherry picked the ones that we could offer and we're telling, you know, telling people obviously we can't support this is an entire piece of software that is dedicated especially to virtual events. Um, so it's something that we can build integrations and kind of tie them back and, and link them with it into the other sites if they decide to go this way. So those are all the features um, that we identified. And then our next step was to take a look at what we were already offering and figure out where the gaps were and how we could improve our site builder platform. Um, 
The challenge with our platform is that we have to kind of make sure that it works for everybody. New features to the entire platform that aren't going to interrupt the workflow of our existing site owners and that add value to a majority of our site owners. So if one, if one of our partners and site owners is asking for a feature, we need to make sure that we actually have a, a larger volume of folks who find that tool or feature valuable um, for us to spend the time to develop it and add it to the entire system. Um, so we really take a look at user experience, uh, complexity of the site building experience, and make sure that we're not adding anything that becomes too challenging for folks to use. So using our existing content type, which has actually, I think was originally developed in 2017, it's, it's, that's where the core of the event content type came from. So there was a lot of room for us to add and grow to it. Um, we've done some minimal improvements since its original development, <laughs> um, but it was really time to look at a refresh. Uh, so our goals in adding and enhancing this content type were that we didn't want to disrupt the workflows that people already had in place. Um, we needed to support both the one-time events as well as these multi-session events, um, all using the same content type. Uh, we had a number of layout frustrations, things that just weren't uh, it, dealing with content in a great visual way that we wanted to improve while we were doing this. And then we decided to go with a phased approach. So everyone who's still used to the old visual appearance got the new fields, but we didn't force them to update into the new look and feel. And so any new sites that are provisioned going forward get the new look and we're, we'll be pushing it out and encouraging our, our existing customers um, to do the update on their own. Eventually, we'll push them and, and they'll have to get off when we're ready to archive it and, and retire that, that old design, um, but giving them a little time to, to be comfortable with the changes. So what did we do to our event content type? Um, we have all the standard fields and we added a number of new ones. Uh, we have a title, obviously pretty, pretty typical for an event, um, but we realized that one area that we weren't dealing with is the challenge when there's a speaker and the speaker's name is really the most important part. That's why people are coming to a particular event. Um, but that speaker's talking about something, and there was no prominent place to display the name of their lecture or the title of what they were talking about. So now we're allowing site owners to decide if the title field is the topic that person is talking about or is their name. But we're also giving them the opportunity to kind of use those fields in a flexible way. Uh, we have our featured image, which can, which can be displayed in a number of different ways. Standard event description, um, summary field that displays in your, in your list of all of your events. Uh, we all also have really robust support for reoccurring events. So we can display a number of dates that are happening in the future, as well as if it happens every Tuesday, that's, that's clear and um, obvious on your event detail page. We also have a showcase of the past dates, if you're looking back um, to see when last, when last it happened. Um, these are some of the challenges uh, that we dealt with in uh, the old design. We didn't have good handling for all of these, all of this information at the top of the page. It became kind of cluttered and confusing um, from a visual experience. So the goal was really to make, put the most important information right at the top and display it uh, in a really easy to understand way. And then from the event point of view, all the things that we realized in this conference situation is that we only had a single location field. That was a major problem for hybrid events especially. So now we added a virtual location field. So now you can, you can have both of those things in one place and people can attend both ways. And you can share a Zoom link or whatever, you know, your Microsoft Teams link, whatever it is that they might need to know. Um, we also acknowledge that registration is something that these multi-session events need to deal with. So we de created a dedicated registration field that can link over to a Drupal form or another tool if they're using that. Uh, we still have related links and related documents because there's always connections that need to be made to other sites and other content. Um, sponsors are incredibly important so we kind of, it is lower on the page but we saw in a lot of our research that there are many sponsors listed, sometimes up to 20 sponsors. So we needed to make sure that we handled events that had both one sponsor and a, a huge number of sponsors. Um, and then speakers, obviously really key in what we're talking about here today for conferences. Um, and we, in introducing this new connection to our to speakers and this new enhanced display, it connects right to our new speaker content type, which I'll talk about and show next. 
And then lastly is session recordings. So we never had a dedicated place within the event to go back after the event and add the recording. So that led to folks kind of putting the recording somewhere else on their site. It had to be tracked down. There wasn't a, a good library or archiving way to handle both the event details and the recording of that event. So we kind of created that for them so it can all be stored in one place and saved in one place. And then once you have all of these events that you've entered in, you need a nice way to display it as we saw. Um, you need to see a whole agenda in, in a quick, at a glance, easy to understand way. So here we have our tabs at the top and then just like we saw in the other models, we have the times down the side so you know when things are happening and a clear title and the associated speaker with those details. Another one we have in progress is also um. done. And then to partner with the additions to the event, the event content type, we also enhanced, added a brand new speaker content type. So we separated this from our people um, which is really used for administrative purposes, recording the faculty and staff and, uh, that keep a department or group running or run a conference or host a conference um, with those one-time guest speakers. Uh, we introduced, it, uh, introduced as part of a new content type, you get a new taxonomy, which is great for um, categorizing those people. Um, this will support both one-time events and those multi-session events with the content type. Uh, and it also resolves kind of that visual hierarchy so that we can promote and visually display and give prominence to those speakers who are really important. So this is the example of one of the speaker pages that we developed. Um, all the things that you would expect, but we decided to keep it leaner than our people content type. So there's no, no fields for con uh, contact information, and this was done intentionally. A lot of speakers don't want you reaching out to them directly, so we, we, didn't, we left those things off, but we did give an, a space for affiliation, their titles, their name, their bio, and they can include any additional information in their bio that might be needed per person. Um, and then one nice design element that we added is this uh, field for a background image. So what that lets um, hosts do, the, the site owners, is add kind of specific conference branding to a speaker page. Just a nice little addition to um, what might be an otherwise boring page where you just see a, a person's headshot. So I'll do a quick demo of um, the site that we have using all of these features and then I think we'll talk about registration briefly and we'll move it move up over to Q&A. So we were lucky to have a campus partner who was ready for these features and helped us kind of implement them. Um, the, the Access, Diversity, and Inclusion team at the Graduate School hosted their very first Inclusive Academy Symposium uh, two weeks ago. You can see they really took advantage of branding. So they had a logo developed and we used some of those graphic elements throughout, this, throughout the site to kind of tie it all together. So this is their homepage and their theme and their date and their location as well as the audience are really broadly um, clear, uh, clearly stated up at the top of the homepage. They also, um, which is not as common in our conferences, but we want to make sure that we support this and we found a good way for them to handle award nominations. So they were going to do special recognition and we created a number of Drupal forms for them as part of their site so that people could submit nominations for all of these different categories of, of awards. We came up with a nice clean way for them to handle sponsor logos. Um, really it's, it's a challenge to take a lot of logos that are a different shape and size we're doing okay. okay. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> um, different shape and size. Some groups have logos, some don't. So we created a nice, clean way for them to display those on the home page. And then we took advantage of the, the new speaker content type. We separated the speakers into categories to really uh, highlight their keynote speakers and then had the whole list down below of everyone who is participating. Um, one other feature that we have in our speaker content type is the ability to link directly to that detail page that I showed you earlier or also link out to a bio page that someone might have. So President Ice Grouper at the university obviously has his own page, his full bio on the president's site. So we allow users to just link directly there instead of recreating and duplicating that information on this site. 
Here's another example of the speaker detail. You can see this is the session that she spoke at. It used to be a challenge. I saw there's actually a session this afternoon about a new module for Drupal, so that could be something that might actually make this a little bit easier in the future. Um, but for now, we're still dealing with multiple registration uh, avenues. So all of our on-campus folks were able to register uh, through campus groups, which is a tool we use here at Princeton, um, and visitors registered for their hybrid event using a Drupal form. We also were able to share live streaming on their site for them through our uh, Media Central connection, um, which is where the campus stores all of our videos. And then now that the event is over, I'm working with them to add post-event features to their site. So we're adding, going back and we're gonna add all the session recordings to those event detail pages. Um, we're gonna create a media page to handle all the, the highlight reel and the photos that they wanna share from the event. Um, we're transforming the nomination page into an honorees page to show everyone who won and kind of building that out so that at next year's event they'll have a good archive of everyone who won a particular award. They'll be able to take a look and see over time who won this award every given year. So we're really trying to future plan uh, the, the, the archiving. Yeah. I have a question. Absolutely. How are you going to archive your videos, your session recordings? So we'll go through and we'll use taxonomy, and now that they're all in those event, it will have the event archive um, by year, and if they decide to add topics, they can create a topic taxonomy for those videos as well. Um, so in, in our event archive page, it'll kind of, you'll be able to browse and filter based on the taxonomy that things are tagged with. But doesn't it uh, occupy a lot of storage if you're going to put it in? All the videos are actually stored on Media Central, which is the campus's um, video platform. So we don't actually host any of those on the site. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So the question was uh, storage of videos and how much space that might take up on your site. But we don't actually encourage our customers to put the video on the site, but to actually um, upload it to YouTube or Media Central or Vimeo, and we use a, a no embed code to display those on the site. Um, and so, yeah, the, the goal over the coming weeks will really be to help them kind of future-proof this site so that next year they can kind of repurpose the pages that they have with the new content and to create the archive pages with everything that happened this year and building out the taxonomy so that they can just add the next year uh, and the next theme and, and keep the site going and growing every year. And then finally, Drupal is obviously good for, um, they've collected all their registration information so they can reach out to everyone who participated and send surveys if they decide to do that. So as I mentioned, registration is a challenge here, and I'll just I'll kind of talk about this from a high level. What we decided that we could handle and, and help people with is simple Drupal forms. So this is this this will work for smaller events. I wouldn't recommend it for anything with a huge attendance. Um, a limited virtual attendance is fine, uh, but if it's if you have a limited capacity, this is probably the best that you can you can handle with a Drupal form. Um, also communication, you get an email when you register, when you respond to a Drupal form, but all communication after that is gonna be manual. So the team who is organizing the conference. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, the team that's organizing the conference has to go out and send those emails to their, to their participants and registrants. Uh, here at Princeton and in, in a lot of higher ed institutions have adopted a tool called Campus Groups. So we have an integration um, called My Princeton U here. At, that's kind of a, Princeton's version of that platform. And we built an integration with that into our site builder. Uh, so we can bring events in directly from there, as well as they can handle all their registration through that tool and all their communication through that tool so that it doesn't actually have to happen through the site builder site. And then finally, just like the Cvent tool that I showed at the beginning, there's certain things that we just can't do within our platform. Um, so encouraging them to use a, an outside paid dedicated event service if they have kind of larger um, conference needs. And that wraps up my portion today. I also have Brian here if you have any development questions because he kind of built all of these things that we had the ideas for. Um, can, I, can I answer any questions for anybody? Yeah. So uh, the registration will use the forms in the template system. 
When you create a Drupal form, you can create an auto response. So it confirms to anyone who submitted that form that their, their submission has been received. And you can craft the language in that auto response to be whatever is appropriate for your event. So it might be, we'll get back to you with additional details, or we've received your res registration, you're now signed up. Right. Um, it just depends on how your team on the back end is going to be managing those those e those responses to the form. So, so you wouldn't have to set up uh, an additional listserv, or, or would you? You would need to take ev all the list of everyone who's registered and kind of create a, a group, an email group of the the list of the registrants. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just had a question about your um, like a call for speakers. Mm -hmm. Do you have so for the issue that we have for? <laughs> we use an external platform for the call for speakers. Yeah. Um, so that we can evaluate appropriately. Mm -hmm. And then our integration into the event site, we're working on revamping that for Pittsburgh so mm -hmm. that it's cleaner and more navigable. Do you have like any tools that we could use to make that integration smoother between an external CFS and the event site? Right. Yes. So <laughs> Um, DrupalCon is, has a call for speakers, so they need to have people participate. So the, you, use an, you use an external site or tool, yes. um, and you're asking if there are any ways to integrate that into, back into the main site. We haven't had to deal with that. Um, I think the call for speakers for most of our campus things are handled separately. I haven't seen that done on any public-facing sites. Um, so they might be reaching out directly to their partners. Um, but I have seen a number of sites, and this kind of deserves a deeper dive in, where they're actually telling students to prepare for a presentation, for example, and providing all the information for students. So I think that's probably next on our list to take a look at. Um, but it's not something we've had to support yet. You said that you guys were using Layout Builder for some of this. What, what parts was that and uh, how was your plan? Why don't you just like show a Sure. I can, I'm going to open the site that we looked at and I'll go to their test site. So Layout Builder is enabled for our site builders on our pages, um, but they are, it's not it, it's not available to our site builders on the event detail page or on the speaker detail page. Those are dedicated content types. The layout is set for our for our builders. But on our home pages, for example, we use layout builders so that you kind of can craft the page however you decide you want to do that and set up the hierarchy for the page. So this is what the back end of our home page site building experience would look like. Um, this is a billboard block that, that we have developed for them to use. It's got dedicated fields in it. Um, we, this is a, a good representation of all the column types that we have set up in Layout Builder for them to choose from. We also have a number of dedicated section styles within Site Builder. So if you go into edit the section, you can set your background image, you can set an overlay on that image, the width of that section you can control, as well as a number of styles. So really they can craft the hierarchy of their home page, however is appropriate for their dedicated conferences. And then you just do that using um, like uh, permissions or something so that we, they can only do certain pages Absolutely, yeah. So the site owners have a, have a lot of control. Um, and there are a number of things that our web development services team can do for them if they're using, a, if they're using or partnering with us on their site. Um, but we try to give them as much flexibility as possible out of the box. Yeah, exactly. So you'll see down here. Um, lots of different, the, sec, the home pages are usually built out of a lot of sections uh, to create the exact layout that we're looking for. Yep. The footer is also a layout builder section so they can add as many columns um, to the footer as well. Alright, walk out of this so I don't ruin it. Did you get good feedback um, about the site after this conference was I did, yeah. So uh, the question was, how was the response um, for this IAM, IA Symposium site? And I think everyone who participated found it very clear. Uh, 
there are some improvements that I want to make because since this is our product and of course I want to keep making it better. Um, but in terms of our campus partner was really happy with how quickly we spun up all of this for them. Um, and I think that's the greatest thing is that a lot of times these conferences are getting organized and coordinated and promoted really close to the actual event. Like the deadlines are very, very tight often, especially for a new event. Um, this one had never happened before, so she didn't have any context on how everything that would be needed until she really got into the process. Uh, so this part of it, she found very seamless um, so that they could really focus on the more challenging parts like coordinating AV and, and getting everyone, uh, making sure everyone was vaccinated and food and music and all the in-person stuff that needs to be uh, a lot of vendors to be dealt with. So this part it should be as easy and straightforward as possible. Um, I also watched the live streaming during the event to make sure that that all went went smoothly and that was really easy to use and, and went 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 well as as I could have hoped. So. Can yeah. you share like the configuration block with the list? Sure. Page, I Absolutely. Guess. So um, I can show, as I mentioned, kind of the interaction of the event content list um, is organized by the dates here. You can see the whole list. The great thing um, about the way this is built, I think is really successful, is that you can click into a given event, um, scan all the details, and you can link to the person's page directly from there. So you can see the full bio from that person's um, information. And then down at the bottom, you can link right back to the event that you were looking at so that you can um, kind of step through all of the different pieces without, without too much challenge. Um, this is a good example too where some of them are internal pages and some of them are external pages. Uh, we didn't used to have that functionality, but we realized people were duplicating people's bios and bios get out of date so quickly that you don't want to be the one owning the information uh, when someone else should maintain something that's changing really frequently. Um, one other highlight I'll call out about the scheduling list block is that, uh, I'll give credit to Brian on this one, this, it's, the system is smart enough to know what day you're on. So if I come back on the second day or third day or fourth day of the event, it's gonna take me right to that tab. So I, I don't default back to the first one that's over and happened already. It's gonna default to the one that's happening today. So that kind of makes the scheduling browsing uh, more seamless and less clicks. Anything else you wanna call out, Brian? Maybe just show the configuration options for that block? Sure. The list. Yeah. So in here, this page is, is also a layout builder page. Um, it's, it's a summary field or a text field up at the top that kind of shows you what you're getting into. And then this is what we call a content list. So this is the aggregation all of, of all of the events that we want to display here in this list. So we give them a lot of different um, configuration options in terms of the fields that they want to show on this page. Um, Again, we try not to be too confusing. We're still working on our UX, but when everyone wants a little bit of everything, we try to keep it as, as easy to use as possible as well as, and robust at the same time. Um, so you can decide to link directly to the detail page. You can do the title as well as the subtitle that I mentioned earlier, the location and the virtual location. You have the ability to display all of these different um, fields from the detail page within the list block or not. Uh, this is what we'll, you'll be able to control it, whether it's group by day or group by day and time. Um, and then you have the ability to kind of format how you want the dates formatted. So we have some circumstances where you might just want this to just say the day, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We have some family weekend events, for example, where it's really just about all the things that are available for parents to do. Um, so that might be a little bit less formal. You wanna just be more casual and friendly about it. So we give them more opportunities to kind of control how those things are displayed. So the block will automatically uh, display the different days of your event in tabs. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. You can see that this block is limited to <laughs> 100 events um, across the seven days I mentioned was kind of where we decided was our, our limit for what we call a uh, conference. All right. And, and the very nature of our, our theme that we use on Site Builder is that the design of the theme is very light. 
Um, and that's so that our campus partners, they like to add as much personal flair per department as they would like um, using CSS injector or doing a custom theme with us. So we make it really simple and clean so that we can layer things on top of it, um, which is a challenge in itself. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'll be here for a little bit longer if you think of anything else. And uh, good luck with your conferences.